my name is Victoria. So we've talked about relationships with God, with our spouses, with our family and friends and colleagues. But there is that relationship that you have with yourself. There is that one where you tell yourself, this is going to work. You know, this is like when you promote, like you're trying to motivate yourself towards a certain particular action. Now, which leads to my question, innovation. Um, as you said, the factory setting is good things come from God and they're planted in us. And it's our job really to execute and bring out that goodness that God has given us to this world. But then there is you, a Kenyan, and you're in Kenya, and uh, all you're being told about is employment. But you, it really does not make sense to you. Not, not, not with a, con a bad connotation, because you might also end up employing people, but you really have this inner feeling of a particular path that you can't really explain. You don't have evidence, but to you, it brings you the peace uh, that uh, you think uh, is going to lead you to your path in life generally. And you find that when this happens to you at a young age, you have a very shaky foundation. You're not like a 40 year old who is like, has corporate experience and they have been trusted in the market and everything. Uh, another question is, how do you ground yourself and follow your path diligently without being swayed around because this way is that you're being told either get a job or or like you know you're unemployed you're literally even not regarded as <laughs> as a factor really and this also now leads me to the other question uh, how can one leverage especially local capital i mean the startup space and what is actually happening is that most of the capital is Western capital. The environment is not very encouraging for the local element because what you find is that most people have some Western uh, experience and then they come here and then now they innovate and then they relate to those investors. And if you have not, don't have that experience, it kind of becomes a challenge. So how do you ground yourself, especially as a person? And then how do you navigate the murky waters of basically uh, innovating and still building, it's a business anyway, uh, and building the business and building the confidence from scratch, not with any leverage. Your father is not some politician or anything, but really uh, sticking to the journey uh, because of course of your intuition and of course the numbers are also telling as well. And of course, head on to the path of self-actualization and all. I'm still digesting that one. <laughs> Um, I would say um, there are practical considerations to take with regards to raising capital uh, in the space you just described. I happen to have some experience investing in tech startups that have, have done well. I also generally raise capital from time to time for our own projects at Grand Acres because we only sell what we own so at some point we need to be buying stuff. Uh, and I can tell you, in terms of local capital, there's as much of it as there is Western capital. Plenty. How you plug into it will be different. We're, we're a young, we're a young uh, market as far as uh, venture capital is concerned, which is why most of the capital we're seeing being moved around is Western. Because that's, a mature, that's a mature market. They understand how to analyze they have structures within which pitches are made and, and so on. Here it's a bit different. Uh, so it's not a question of there being no capital. There's plenty, a ton. Uh, in either case, what matters most is your value proposition to the owner of the capital. They don't care how nice you are, how altruistic your vision is, how cool your innovation is, uh, that does not mean jack. Uh, and that's the first thing you, one has to realize. You have to, yes, those things count, but they are completely secondary to what is in it for them. So you need to understand how to pitch them in a way that makes sense to their sensibilities. When you're talking about local capital is what's my security? 
how do I know I'm going to get my money back? Uh, that's going to be very different from when you're pitching the Norwegian guy or the guy from Silicon Valley or any number of these uh, venture capitalists who, for, for the most part, uh, and this is something I'm saying from experience, for the most part, understand that nine out of 10 investments they make will fail. But the one that succeeds will make up for all the others and then some. The psychology is very different from the local guy you're trying to convince to part with money he has built up over who knows how long, <laughs> dealing with who knows what. <laughs> Do you understand? There's a very different psychology and you just need to take time to understand what that is and address it directly. In actual fact, in both, uh, actually three tech startups I've, I've invested in, they all started with seed capital that is local. Very important because even the foreign capital wants to see local buy-in before they risk their capital. Mm. If your neighbors don't see your value, why on earth would they risk their capital? Do you understand? But you need to understand how to pitch that local guy versus the... That's what I would say. In terms of uh, dealing with naysayers, I, I mean, you just need to suck it up and get on with it. It's, it's, it's the best way I can tell you. It comes with the territory. Par for the course, as they say. Uh, if you're going to pursue a dream that's consequential enough, just get used to the fact that that's going to happen, and this is only the beginning. <laughs> and you have to grow thick skin. Does that make sense? Uh, which is why, again, very critical that you surround yourself with the right people. Mm -hmm. The six people you spend most time with will even affect your outlook about that. And I could, I could give you endless examples of my own experience as far as that's concerned. Um, your internal compass ne and, and voice needs to be louder than every other voice out here. And then pick and choose very carefully who you allow into that circle. To borrow from Pais's uh, uh, reference points, um, the story of Joseph, uh, which I'm sure you know, a bit at least. Yeah, he shared a dream, and because of that, he was thrown into a pit. A lesson <laughs> for us there was: be careful who you share your dreams with. <laughs> That means you have to be woke enough or aware enough to know who is in your circle, what they think, what they're about, before you let them in, even if it's your brothers. And to be honest, uh, a lot of times, that's where the biggest opposition comes from. Because of what that means. It means change, it means discomfort. Oh, this chick, is, she's gonna do well and leave us in the hood. We can't let her, <laughs> you know, we can't let her go. She's stuck here with us. Or they just have no, they don't have the vision you do. And so you have to, at that point, become the ego we were <laughs> alluding to earlier. Leave the chickens behind. Don't judge them for being chickens. That's what, it's just what chickens do. Understand that you're an ego and you need to, you need to bounce. Mm -hmm. and, and the other egos will find you. Um, I know that comment is laced with so many metaphors, but uh, I think you understand the point. It's normal. Uh, just understand that it is normal. Accept it. Don't feel bad about it. Just focus on your, on your vision. Refine it. Become the expert at that. Um, and my experience has been normally, the more I focus on that, one way or the other, uh, and for me personally, God has everything to do with it. So I highly recommend that you have a conversation with him mm. uh, about that situation. He will bring around the right people to support, mm. to help, to encourage. Uh, he'll close the doors that needs to be closed. He'll open those that need to be open. Um, 
but strictly speaking, even if you were not the type of person who believed in God, there are certain universal truths that will work uh, around you just sticking with it. Steve Jobs did not believe in God. Yes, my point is because I don't know everyone's personal beliefs here. I don't want to assume that you do. Uh, because if you don't, and then that's a separate conversation we can have and we can close that deal <laughs> Be because you know that's that's what i absolutely believe in and I, I don't shy away from telling people it's by god's grace but there are certain things you just have to do yeah you have to exert some energy you have to become the expert in your field you have to understand the lay of the land understand the profiles of the different people you're trying to talk to and be prepared mm -hmm. and let God handle the rest because he does in fact in most cases he already has he's waiting for you he's waiting for you to bust a move yeah awesome wow I think he's uh, he's really answered it properly um, for me it's just a question to all of you how many people here are Christians everybody is a Christian here so let me ask a question why do we pray hmm? To grow? Okay. 90% of the time is to ask God for something. <laughs> mm. So, the reason why I pray, I pray for, I pray for direction. Lord, how, how do I move from here? And I found when I... When I make that my agenda for prayer, a lot of my issues are resolved. You see, when I listen to you, you have so many questions. And there's so, then the, where your confusion is coming from, you have so many sources of direction. So when the, all this information gets to you, it clashes and you have all this conflict. You are not sure whether you're going this way or that way. You, or rather, you know you are going this way, but you are hearing voices, you need to go this way or that way. And, and for me, just to shut down all the other voices, my sole reason for prayer is to seek God for direction. And I can show you examples from Genesis to Revelation, that that was the reason why everybody prayed. And my favorite one is, is 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 8 where David had lost, David and his men had lost everything. And they wept until they had no strength. And even the men of David wanted to stone him. And he was alone. And he said, and the Bible says, and David inquired of the Lord. And, and this is what he asked God. Um, should, shall I pursue them? the people who took my wife and children and all our things, and shall I overtake them? And then the Bible says, and God answered him, pursue them, and for surely you will overtake them, and without fail you shall recover all. So he got what? Direction. He didn't start pursuing. The problem with us, what do we do? We just start? Just get, you want to start a business? You know, you come from, you've gotten some money. You're like, now I have some money in the bank. I'm going to start a business. You don't even ask God which business you want to, to and we are Christians. You know, how many people here have eaten peanut butter? Do you know that was a good idea? This guy, he was uh, a scientist, lived in this neighborhood. Nothing was growing well in that neighborhood and used to walk in the, in the woods at 4 a.m. in the morning and just pray to God and ask God for direction. And he asked God, God, we have this problem. What should we do? And then God tells him, tell everybody to plant peanuts. So he tells everybody in his neighborhood, plant what? Peanuts. Then guys came to him back and said, now we have a problem. We have so much peanuts, we do not know what to do with it. Eh? Peanuts, now we have a pro? 
a problem. Now you see Lillian, there is all there are always problems. So he's walking in the woods and he's like uh, asking God many things, and God is like, You're not asking me the right question. Finally, he asked God, What do we do with the peanuts? And God said, now you've answered, you've asked me the right question. By the way, it's, you, you can't even check it on the internet. You'll find it. It's there. That story is there. And God told him, I'll show you what to do with the peanuts. And he went to the laboratory and God gave him 300 uses of peanuts. 300 using the, 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 the makings, the, 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 the chemistry of, of uh, peanut. 300 uses, and one of them was peanut butter. George Washington Carver was his name. George Washington He's an African American. African American. What did he ask God for? Direction. When I say we need to revert back to our factory settings, I really mean it. We've made prayer a place for complaining, not a place for direction. In fact, we even if, if you don't like your neighbor, you go tell God, but now you need to kill my neighbor. <laughs> God, is, God is not interested in those kind of things. He's like, can you ask me the on the next thing that I, you should be doing because you are here for a, for a short period and you have a purpose. So I, uh, you've asked as many questions. I can't answer all the questions, but I'll refer you to the one who sets the factory settings. He will give you direction. So if your path is entrepreneurial, let me tell you, in my experience, when God has given me direction, no one can change me. No human being can, even my father, my mother, even my, the biggest spiritual authority. As long as I know I've heard from God, it's either you align with it or you're out of, out of the way. You get, eh? The reason why we do not have that conviction in our pursuit is because we don't have that backing. But once you hear that direction, that's it. No one, you, ca you can become a billionaire just by selling oranges. As long as God gave you that idea, I'm telling you, you will sell oranges, people will be coming to you looking for oranges and they are passing everybody else. But you, your oranges taste different from everybody else. Yet, Sorry, sometimes I switch to be a preacher. Eh? <laughs> but that's the best way I can answer your question. Seek him for direction. Awesome.